Precalculus makes no sense. We put some letters on a page and boom. What the heck is going on here? To understand all of this, we're gonna need to go back to where we left off. Remember how polynomials had x raised to some power? Well, exponentials flip that. Instead of having y is equal to x to the n, which are polynomials, we have y is equal to n to the x, where the variable is the exponent, hence exponential functions. They tell us how a starting value grows or declines exponentially at a certain rate. The exponential function starts near zero and then flies upwards. It also has this line called a horizontal asymptote, which is the line that an exponential approaches but never crosses. We write exponential functions in the form y is equal to a times b to the x. b represents the rate of growth or decline, a represents the initial value, and x represents how long it grows. Alright, logarithms are the inverses of exponentials. For example, if 2 cubed is 8, then log 2 of 8 is 3. Now if you don't specify this number, or what we call a base, then people will automatically assume that your base is 10. If you write ln of something for natural logarithm, it means that the base is e, which is approximately 2.718. Okay, now remember when I said that logarithms are the inverses of exponentials. From the last video, we know that function inverses have a whole bunch of special properties. In fact, the logarithm graph looks like an exponential graph reflected across the line y is equal to x. Because of this inverse relationship, logarithms inherit several useful properties. Here are a few. Let's do a quick example. To find log base 5 of 125, notice that 125 can be expressed as 5 cubed. From this property here, we can take out the exponent. Then from this property, we can turn this expression into 1, giving us 3. Enough talk about algebra, let's talk shapes, specifically triangles. Trigonometry starts with right triangles. We look at three main ratios, sine, cosine, and tangent. Each of these compares different sides of the triangle relative to a given angle. The acronym SOCA TOA helps you remember them. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent is opposite over adjacent. What the heck does this mean? For example, if we had a triangle with the dimensions 1, square root 3, and 2, and we are looking at this angle, which we will call theta, cosine of theta would equal the side adjacent to the angle over the hypotenuse, or 1 half. Sine of theta would be the side opposite to the angle over the hypotenuse, or square root 3 over 2. Finally, tangent is opposite over adjacent, or square root 3 over 1, or just square root 3. But what if you want to use angles bigger than 90 degrees? This is what the unit circle is for. The unit circle is a circle centered at the origin with radius 1. Every point on the unit circle corresponds to cosine theta comma sine theta, where theta is the angle measured from the positive x axis. To see why this is, let's pick a random point. Now if you draw these lines, we form a triangle. Wait a minute, that's the same triangle we saw before. If this angle is theta, then cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. On the unit circle, the hypotenuse is 1, and the adjacent side is just the x-coordinate of the point. So cosine of theta equals the x-value. By the same reasoning, sine theta equals the y-value. There are a few angles whose sine and cosine values are worth memorizing because they appear frequently. 30 degrees, 45 degrees, and 60 degrees. Once you know these values, you can get the sine and cosine of related angles just by changing the signs. Because degrees are a pretty dog water unit for everything, people measure angles in a unit called radians instead of degrees. The conversion factor between degrees and radians is pi over 180. So if you have 30 degrees and you wanted to convert it into radians, you'd multiply 30 by pi over 180, giving pi over 6 radians. To go the other way, multiply by the reciprocal 180 over pi. Question, what happens if you graph y is equal to sine of x? You get a wave that oscillates between negative 1 and 1, repeating every 2 pi radians. Cosine looks the same but starts at 1 when x equals 0. Tangent, however, is sine x over cosine x, and since cosine x equals 0 sometimes, the tangent graph has vertical asymptotes. Between the asymptotes, tangent increases from negative infinity to positive infinity, and repeats every 1 pi radians. The reciprocal of sine, cosine, and tangent are cosecant, secant, and cotangent. Their graphs are a little weird, but just find the asymptotes by setting the denominator equal to 0 and plotting points. 
Sometimes, instead of starting with an angle, you're given a value and need to find the angle that created it. That's where inverse trig functions come in. Sine inverse, cosine inverse, and tangent inverse take a ratio and return an angle. For example, if sine theta equals 1 half, you can take the sine inverse of both sides, giving theta is equal to sine inverse of 1 half, or 30 degrees. This is not the only solution to this equation, because the inverse function has a restricted range. Well, that's too many big words for me, so basically just check the unit circle for more solutions. Alright, let's head north. Why? Because of polar coordinates. Normally, we describe points on a plane with the ordered pair x, y. This way of describing points is good in many cases, but it's sometimes better to use polar coordinates. Using polar coordinates, we describe points using r, theta, where r is the distance from the origin and theta is the angle from the positive x-axis. So 30, 90 degrees means a point 3 units away from the origin at a 90 degree angle, which is the same as 0, 3 in rectangular coordinates. To convert from polar to rectangular, use x is equal to r cosine of theta and y is equal to r sine of theta. To convert back, use r is equal to square root of x squared plus y squared and theta is equal to tan inverse of y over x. For example, the point 3 comma 90 degrees from before converts to rectangular form using the formulas x equals 3 cosine of 90, which is just 0, and y is equal to 3 sine of 90, which is just 3. Thus, the point is again 0 comma 3. Just like there are equations in Cartesian coordinates, there are in polar. Here are the most important ones. r equals the number k makes a circle of radius k. r equals a theta gives you an Archimedean spiral, which spirals outwards as theta increases. Lymacons have the form r is equal to a plus or minus b cosine of theta, or r is equal to a plus or minus b sine of theta. There are specific types of Lymacons based on the values of a and b, listed here. Rose curves are of the form r equals a sine n theta, or a cosine n theta. If n is odd, the graph has n petals, whereas if n is even, there are two n petals. To plot a polar curve, plug in values of theta, rotate to each angle, draw the corresponding radius, and connect points. All this talk about trig is getting boring, so it's about time we talk about vectors and matrices. A vector is a list of numbers, typically written in a single column or row. You can think of a vector geometrically as an arrow in space, usually starting at the origin. The numbers in a vector tell you how far to move along each dimension. The dot product is a way to multiply two vectors, and the result is a number that indicates how much the two vectors point in the same direction. To compute the dot product of two vectors, multiply their corresponding entries and add the results. The cross product is a special operation that only works for vectors in three dimensions. The result is a new vector that is perpendicular to both of the original vectors. The cross product is calculated by this formula or by taking the determinant of this matrix, but we'll get to that. A matrix is just a grid of numbers arranged in rows and columns. The size of a matrix is always given as number of rows times number of columns. Notice that a vector is simply a matrix with a single column or single row. Adding and subtracting matrices is straightforward. They must have the same size, and you just add or subtract the corresponding numbers. Scalar multiplication is also pretty easy. It just means taking a single number and multiplying every entry in the matrix by that value. Matrix multiplication is more complicated. For two matrices A and B, the product AB is only possible if the number of columns in A equals the number of rows in B. To find any single entry in the resulting matrix, take the dot product of a row from A with a column from B, and calculate. The identity matrix is a special square matrix with 1s on the main diagonal and zeros everywhere else. It acts like the number 1 in multiplication, A times I equals A. Matrices are used to solve systems of linear equations. A system like 1x plus 2y equals 5 and 3x plus 4y equals 6 can be converted into a single matrix equation of the form ax equals b, where a is the matrix of coefficients, x is the vector of variables, and b is the vector of constants. You can check that these representations describe the same system using matrix multiplication. Now that we have this form, we can further condense the system into this form, what we call an augmented matrix. One method for solving these matrices is Gaussian elimination, also known as row reduction. 
In the method, we perform three basic row operations, swapping rows, multiplying a row, and adding rows. Using these row operations, we can simplify the matrix into a form with zeros below the main diagonal. Then, we convert the augmented matrix back into a system and it's easy to solve. Okay, quick recap. We went from this system, converted it into augmented matrix form, then reduced it using row operations, converted it back, and then solved. Another method for solving augmented matrices is gauss jordan elimination. It's similar to Gaussian elimination, but we also get zeros above the main diagonal. The determinant of a matrix is a useful number that can only be calculated for square matrices. We represent it with either a DET symbol or bars. For a 2x2 two two matrix, it's calculated with this formula. For example, if you have the matrix 1, 3, 2, 4, the determinant would be 1 times 4 minus 3 times 2, which is equal to negative 2. Now for a 3x3 three three matrix, it's slightly more complicated. We take this element and multiply by the determinant of this matrix, subtract this element times the determinant of this matrix, finally add this element multiplied by this determinant. From this, you get the determinant. Bigger determinants require more complicated methods, which are too smart for us. Last thing, matrix inverses. Here's a simple analogy. Let's say we wanted to solve 5x equals 10. How do we do this? Well, we multiply both sides by 1 fifth, which cancels with the 5. In a similar way, if we wanted to solve this matrix equation, we could multiply by an inverse matrix, which would cancel out this matrix, leaving us with an answer on the right side. To find this matrix inverse, we set up an augmented matrix with our current matrix on the left side and the identity on the right. Then we perform row operations to get the identity on the left. On the right, we get the inverse matrix. Welp, that's pretty much it. If you don't subscribe, then you, my friend, will lose your hair.